<laughs> All right, we're live whenever you're ready. Uh, we got like one minute. I just want to make sure it's all working. Yeah. Fantastic. Hi. I'm so sorry, but I'm curious. Hi. How are you? Came awfully close. I recognize your face. I saw you signed. Yeah, I did. We were out. We were out spent though. That's yeah, that was tough. I'm giving it a go next year. Yeah. I got your email today. I'll be sending that out so you can as well. Oh, good. Um, I might be early next week. I should help people to everybody. Yeah, we have to get our numbers to 10. Probably. I'll be there with my What? Probably two weeks from now. Uh, so we can. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. I think we've done everything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's my sound. So you have to do one favor, pardon all the little feet that are also in the building. It is Earth Week. We're a little on the busy side, right? It's a good thing. We've got a partnership with the Zoological Society and MPS here today. So the bathrooms are right outside here. We may have a little mud. The kids are outside. I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> um, what else is the housekeeping should I do here? I think that's about it. We're going to turn it over. First, I want to first introduce our Danny Danson, Executive Director of the John Green Farmhouse. I don't know. I'm just going to talk loud. You talk loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited that you're all here and see such a <laughs> There oh, it is. <laughs> There's the microphone. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm really looking forward to this partnership. I was so, so very excited when both Kate and Kristen wanted to work with me and get this lecture series started. It's something that's very, very interesting to me. Um, one of my favorite classes that I took in grad school was environmental history, so I'm very excited to be talking about this lecture. Um, and also, I've said this like five times, I'm very excited to be introducing Kate Erickson. Uh, she's a professor of history at um, MATC, um, and then her specialization is in Native American history as well. So she, this lady knows what she's talking about. Um, I know you guys are going to really enjoy what, what she has to, uh, to say today. She's going to be kicking off the three-part lecture series um, with the beginning of the human connection to the earth. Um, and that's about it. Uh, okay, take it out. So we're going to start again. Thank you, Dana and Kristen. Oh, this is just awesome. Especially having a round bay where it's not so formal, we have friends watching online, which is good. But I hope to see you all at the next two questions. Can you um, mention the chat questions I forgot? So people can ask questions. Oh, yes. Questions. If you are online, take your questions in. We'll do some question and answer at the end. All right, so my portion of this series is really looking at what life was like here prior to the United Centers. How did we view it? Now, I'm a professor of history at the Milwaukee Area Technical College. Uh, Native American history and Wisconsin history was my specialty. I'm also a medical member of the United Nations. 
So part of this is also sharing my culture um, with others. One thing to keep in mind though, uh, not all the tribes in the state are the same. There are quite a few differences. <laughs> but a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, we share a common with each other. All right, so the beginning. One of the most important things I need to start off with uh, is something called the principle of equal and diverse. Uh, that's not what we call it. <laughs> For us, it's just common sense every day what we do. Uh, but the principle of equal and diverse is called all the creative forms, including the unborn, are entitled to the natural benefits of the earth. Um, essentially, it's during a person's lifetime, you are the caretaker of whatever little piece of earth you've been put on. And your job is to live and thrive and take care of that land, but most importantly, hand it to the next generation in as good of condition, if not better, than you received it. When we look at kinship systems, which is a whole different pressure, um, the idea of community is what's important. It's the survival of the community as a whole. It's not the individual, the me, the I. It's the entirety of the community, because together, you're going to survive, apart, alone. And it's the same ideas with nature. We can't survive without it. We rely on everything else. And because of that, all the rest of creation has equal rights to live and thrive. Now, this is very important to understand because once the tribes are being approached and asked to give up their land, it's an extremely important concept. How, how can you own, you can't own the land, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to itself and the rest of creation. Now, there are ideas so far as usership, whereas this tribe's going to live in this area, this group's going to live in this area, and a lot of that's done for practicality. You don't want to overtax your area, you don't want to overhunt areas, you don't want to overharm areas. But the principle of equal entitlement, that's usually one of the things my students tend to get confused about. And in reality, it, it takes humans off the top of any sort of hierarchy and places them at the bottom. Because in reality, when you think about it, humans compared to the rest of creation, we're kind of pathetic. When you think about it, everything we wear, Everything we use, our homes, right? You have to take something from creation to build them. Right? We can't just survive out in the wilderness alone ourselves. We need to clothe ourselves. You know, we, we don't have the ability to, you know, run after and catch a deer with our bare hands, right? We need to make tools using bows and arrows, we're using wood, we're using stone, right? We're taking animal hides. To make our clothing, other supplies that we need. We need the rest of creation to survive. Now, if humans were to disappear off the planet, just imagine it. How do you think the rest of creation would carry on? They'd probably be a lot better off without us, quite honestly. Right? I know my cats and my dogs would be missing me sorely because I'm an easy food source. But eventually, the rest of creation would take over, right? The, the woods would heal themselves, the rivers would heal themselves, the ocean would heal themselves. Um, you look at Chernobyl, for example. A lot of that site nature is reclaiming. So when you look at yourself in terms of not being on top of the hierarchy, you automatically have a different relationship with the rest of creation. And different levels of respect. So respect is vitally important. You have respect for all plants, you have respect for all animals, you have respect for all seasons, you have respect for all places. Now places are extremely important. Okay? For those of you who've done any traveling, okay, the Midwest has its own distinct seasons. Right? Our own sometimes normal weather patterns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 
um, the snow would not be snow would not be. But places are extremely important. Could we live the way we live now? Down in the southwest. Just picking up the down in the southwest. Right? No green lawns. Right? Very few big forests. The animals change, right? Different types of animals, very different types of weather. Place is important. So again, when the tribes are being asked to move, their whole belief system and way of life is being interrupted. When we talk about respecting the plants, when we talk about surviving as a group, as a whole, the ability to know your plant life is very important, especially for those who are healers in the community. If you're going to be a healer, you are very well trained and very specialized in herbs. They're having a hard time. I'll work on the song. <laughs> so healing is super important. Okay, you need to know your plant life in order to do any type of work. And it is said that within the plant world, the plant people have remedies for every illness or ailment in the human world. It's just whether or not you know what it is. For us, Oneidas, one of the things we have is called number six. Number six, we call it that because the word is way too long to say. <laughs> Super hard to pronounce. Uh, but what it is, is it's actually wild bergamot. And we harvest that. It's usually the end of August, but it seems to be getting earlier and earlier in the year. Uh, but we harvest the flowers and the leaves off the bergamot and dry them and save them. And any type of chest congestion cold you have, throw a handful and a coffee filter, run through your coffee pot, chuck it out, a couple days, it was fun. It's fantastic. It's natural and it's free. Aspirin, red okay. The problem is though, you have to know your area. And if your area changes because you're moved, or if your area changes because of other influences, it's very hard to continue surviving. Respecting the animals, that's super important. Okay? Uh, there are a whole lot of conversations going on right now about uh, the deer birds. How many deer do we have? What are we going to do for hunting season? Conversations about the wolves. Okay? Conversations about the elk population. <laughs> A lot of times, the settlers, and especially the missionaries, thought that natives worshipped animals. I mean, when you look around and you see some of the effigy marks that we still have in, in the state, a lot of them, they're animal-shaped. You know, they're not necessarily domes, conical domes. Most of them are animal-shaped, and a lot of them um, reflect uh, some of the clan names of the various tribes in the state. It wasn't that we were worshipping the animals, it was that we were respecting the animals. Okay. Uh, you never overhunted. You never overharvested. Okay. When you went hunting, when uh, the males usually in the group would go hunting and would take a deer, it wasn't the idea that the hunter was super, super skilled. There also was that element of that deer recognizing the need of the That kind of idea of karma, that reciprocal relationship that you can take. So if you go out to hunt, you would put down tobacco or you would put down kinnikinnik. In kinnikinnik, uh, have you been on one? Hey, hey, down there. That uh, means much mixed, and it refers to a mixture of sage, sweet grass, cedar, and tobacco. You would put that down before you went hunting uh, to show your respect and to show as a sign of good faith that you were going to do right by your hunt. Okay? And the idea was that nature of creation would see that. You're humbling yourself saying, you know, I need to feed my community. When you manage to trap an animal, or you manage to spear a fish, or you manage to shoot a deer, you would then also put down more tobacco, more commitment, making that animal, forgiving itself, so that you could feed your community. 
So it's very much so this idea of reciprocal relationships, this give and take, that respect. Obviously, you have to respect the seasons. Uh, we have four very distinct seasons in this state, and in a little bit I'll get into exactly how Native food practice their seasonal rounds. Uh, but you definitely have to respect Mother Nature and the weather because a lot of that's going to determine whether or not you survive. <clears throat> so, spring. Spring is considered to be March, April, and May, so we are in spring right now. Stuff's starting to thaw out, sap starts running. Usually what happens is end of February, beginning of March, you're picking up your community and you're moving to wherever it is you're going to be tapping your trees for the year. Now, sometimes you would be going to maybe say the same camp you were at the year before. In that case, when you arrive at that camp, you're going to have wigwams or decorate frames left behind. Then okay. all you need to do <clears throat> is roll up your bark and re-shingle, and there you go. If you were smart too, and you knew you were going to go back to that spot and sugar bush again, you would leave food behind. Okay. At the end of your fall harvest, you would go back to your sugar bush site and you would bury very deeply corn, maybe some uh, pemmican, which are um, kind of protein packed full of leaves. Corn, wild rice, because obviously coming out of winter, you're probably going to be hungry and you're going to need to feed people. So, March is usually when. We start um, seeing camps being made. We start seeing planting. And one of the common misconceptions is that you know, we kind of wandered around. No, not at all. Not at all. We had very specific places we would go from season to season. Um, in the spring, is usually when you're starting to plant your gardens. Uh, gardens could be anywhere from one acre to 20 acres. Some of the gardens in northern Wisconsin could be up to 300 acres done in a step terrain, depending on what the microclimate was. And a lot of the times the planting that we did was companion planting. We call it three sisters. Um, you plant your corn and your beans and your squash all together. So you didn't do rows, okay? You would have corn planted in the center. Around where you planted that corn, you would plant your beans. And then around the beans, you would plant your squash. So the beans are all the corn. The squash spreads out around the base, which keeps moisture in, keeps weeds down. Uh, you can replant those areas over and over and over and over and over again. Because when the corn leaves out of the soil, the beans and the squash come back. And when you cook them all together, it makes a perfectly balanced diet. Because you have to have certain types of proteins and other vitamins and minerals in order to bring the nutritional value that the corn out. So they were sophisticated. So you're cleaning your spring site, you're getting all of your supplies ready. In the middle here we have birch bark McCucks. McCuck is a birch bark container that you would use to collect your sap. So the women are fixing up the homes, the men are out fishing, the fish are starting to spawn. Sturgeon, very big deal for the tribes in the state. Sturgeon are going to spawn in the state, but hopefully the weather kind of calms down, we get some consistent temperatures. So the men, they're out spearing fish, they're out netting fish, you're also out collecting new plants and grasses. You're always thinking towards the future. Winter is cold, you're going to spend a lot of time indoors. Uh, during the spring, the summer, and the fall, you're collecting basically whatever supplies you need to work on things in the future. So in the spring, one of the best times to collect birch bark. Now, birch bark is used for canoes, it's used for cups, it's used for fire starters, it's used primarily to cover homes. So this one has birch bark on the top and it has elm on the side because it wasn't enough birch bark to cover it entirely. But birch bark, bark stick, actually has a higher BT rating than water insulation. And it's naturally an insect repeller and it's light. So when you're carrying it from place to place, it's not such a burden. 
So most of the time, unless we were going to be using the birch bark to make a canoe, when you would need lots of it, you usually took it from a live tree. You didn't cut the tree down because that was considered a waste. So what you can see with this tree here, it's one trunk with three um, parts of the tree coming out. This one here, what they'll do is they'll make a cut just in through the bark at the top. I'll make a cut at the bottom. And then you can kind of see the little white line. You make one cut all the way up the side. And you need delicate little fingers to go underneath and peel that part away. Because the sap is running, it's much, much easier to do with the spray. So even if you're not going to use your birch bark right now, right now in the spring is when you need to harvest it so that you have it. Because you're always thinking ahead. Okay? All right, summer, June, July, and August. <laughs> so, June, July, and August. Uh, June, uh, in Anishinaabe language or Ojibwe language, uh, the translation here should be time for picking strawberries. That's when you're going out, you're picking your wild strawberries. Um, you're picking raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, choke cherries, blueberries, 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 elderberries, black cherries, currants, wild plums. There's all kinds of food out in the environment if only you know what you can eat. And a lot of these things don't need to be planted. A lot of these berry bushes are taken care of naturally. And what you can see late spring is a lot of slash and burn, where natives would naturally use fire to clear out areas, to encourage plants to grow desired plants. So if you want more strawberries, you clean up the area around it so they can expand. Okay. It's also necessary to do um, some of this fire work because certain species of trees need fire or heat in order for their seeds to germinate. Now, periodically, as we start getting into July, you're going to start checking on your wild rice beds. Now, wild rice, the only place in the world that our wild rice grows naturally is in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. Grows on the water. So, let's see. I'm going to fast forward to my next slide, but I'm going to come back to you. So, this here is a wild rice bed. You can see the water further out. That's deeper water. This isn't land, this is water. Okay, wild rice grows in water, usually about three feet deep, shallow, slow moving. It likes the muck. So if you've ever been swimming in a pond and you step in and it's all mucky, that's what wild rice likes. So what you're doing in July is families are starting to get together and check on the wild rice beds. Now each tribe would have what they would call a rising chief. And that person's job was to check all of the wild rice beds to tell when it was ready to harvest. When can we harvest it? Now, just before it was harvestable, each family would go around to whichever bed they had been assigned to, and they would bind the rice. Okay? So pretend this rice is in the water. Pretend we've got water here. What they would do is they would use a twine to bind the rice and to bend it over. The idea is you're going to trap those rice kernels inside. You want to hold them in there until they're nice and ripe. Because if the wind is too strong, it's going to blow all of the rice into the water. You want to save it until it's ready. So July is when you're going to be doing all that prep work. You're also working to catch your canoes. You're working to Patch up uh, the containers you're going to use to process the wild rice. All of these things are constantly doing work. And the neat thing about that is, you know, who does the work? Well, when we talk about uh, kinship systems and clan systems, from the moment you are born, your clan is determined. So, for me, I'm a clan. And my clan has certain responsibilities. And from little on, you are trained. This is what your responsibilities are. You're grown one, you're allowed to watch people. 
you want to participate so that when you're old enough, they can put you to work right away and you know exactly what you're doing. There's no wondering where you fit in or what your role is or what you're responsible for. You know this. Okay. Now, anything that you would need during the winter, you're also harvesting. So you're harvesting a lot of different grasses that you could use to make baskets with. Um, you're harvesting um, a lot of other roots and tubers and things like that that can be dried out and saved for you for food in the future. Some of the things they'd be harvesting would be watercress leaves, pigweed leaves, aster leaves, beech peas, wild peas, wild asparagus. Um, you're also collecting dandelion flowers, cranberries, elderberries, choke cherries, currants, wild grapes, honeysuckle flower nectar, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries to make wine. There's this common misconception that we did not know what alcohol was prior to European arrival. This is not the case. <laughs> the difference is, though, it was not consumed for recreational purposes. Um, it wasn't like you could go to a pub or something and have a beer. No, it was it was wine that was used for special ceremonies, special situations. So it wasn't made in large quantities, but yes, we did know what it was. Some examples I have on here. Um, some work that would be done during the winter time. So say you saved up your birch bark, and say you managed to snake yourself a porcupine. Something you could do during the winter would be to create these containers. So these containers here are made out of birch bark, and this one has um, sweet grass lying at the top. But with all the decoration you see on here, those are porcupine quilts. My earrings are actually porcupine quilts. So you're saving all those things to make useful items or just to make something that's pretty that you should use. Over here we have lacrosse sticks. Lacrosse is an indigenous sport. Um, the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy um, were known to play lacrosse uh, to settle disputes. Tribes ran on consensus politics. Uh, the, chief, the chief or the sachem or the bogeyman, whichever word you would call them, uh, didn't have absolute authority. How we governed was you came up with something and you talked and you negotiated until everybody agreed. But you don't always agree. <laughs> so, say, for example, um, a tribe you're friendly with comes and asks for your assistance in warfare, you're being attacked by the But you're also friendly with the group they want you to help them fight against. What do you do? Are you for the war or are you against the war? So usually what would happen is a game of lacrosse would take place, and the field could be a mile long, two miles long, three miles long, and we played through the woods, through the fields. Um, it was much more violent than the lacrosse that we see played right nowadays, trying to get some sort of run deep with that, and then you kind of get to the same level. But the idea was, is those who are for war are on one team, those who are against the war are on the other team, and whoever wins that game. It was a way to settle things in a not too terribly violent way, but enough so that people could get their aggression out and express you know, what their feelings and emotions were. So June, July, August, it's nice out. You have a lot of events going on. Um, you have a lot of kids being taught uh, what they need in order to survive in the future. But June, July, and August, I would say is kind of more like the only time you get to relax a little bit. You're going to go back and forth and check on the gardens that you planted in the spring. But most likely, if you did it right, you don't have to worry about the pests. You don't have to worry about the weeding. You don't have to worry about watering. Fall. September, October, and November. So September is leaves changing color moon. October is leaves falling moon. And November is ice is forming moon. Kind of give you an idea of how literal they are when facing the weather to tell time. So during the early fall, um, women are going to go out and they're going to harvest their gardens. They're going to drive whenever they can as far as driving. Uh, drying the corn, you're going to dry that over a very low fire. Um, some of the corn would be ground into the meal, um, and that could be saved to make casseroles, breads, soups, pancakes. 
Um, and then we would save some of the whole kernels in caches. And oftentimes you would use birch bark, the Cox birch bark containers, because it's naturally blood repellent and water repellent, and you would bury those things um, as close to the frost line as you can in order for them to stay preserved. You're also um, going to be harvesting your wild rice. So traditionally, wild rice was harvested in September. As time has gone on and the weather has changed, it's starting to be more of an August thing. But back in the day, you have you have harvested wild rice in September. Now, this is probably, aside from sugar bush, this is the biggest task you're going to have during the year. So your rice and cheese has paid attention to which beds you're going to harvest. Some beds you might not. Maybe there's not enough wild rice there because it seeds itself. Maybe you're going to let this one rest for a while. The ones further out you're going to work on. So what do you do? The tribe comes together and you set up your rice and medium. So in order to rice, you're going to have two people in a canoe. So there's going to be one person standing in the back of the canoe. And they're going to have a long pole that has a fork on the end. And that person is the pole worker. And they're going to push you through the water. Okay. The reason why you don't use paddles is because the wild rice is growing in bulk. And any high bake or too much pressure is going to rip that wild rice out of the bed and it's going to sink and your rice is going to be ruined. So if you have only those two small points of contact, you can kind of push and glide yourself in the water. The next person is sitting in the middle of the canoe with what they call knockers. So imagine two extremely long wooden drumsticks, probably at least a yard long. And what that person does is as the polar moves them through the wild rice bed, that person sits there with their ricing sticks and they bend the rice over with one and they use the knocking stick in their other hand to tap the top of the rice to knock it into the bowl. And so you have to have a rhythm. You have to have this back and forth. So it's pretty rhythmic. A lot of times you'd sing because it would help keep you um, in rhythm. But that's just harvesting. So once your canoe is full, you're going to bring that back to shore. And then you've got four steps you're going to have to carry out. And literally everyone in the community is helping from the smallest kids all the way up to the elders. Okay. So, dry, parch, dance, and winnow. Those are the four steps you go through once you get that rice to shore. So, when you dry the rice, what do you do? Large birch bark mats are sewn together. Think of like taking it up like a big top and spreading it out on the ground. But you're using birch bark that's been sewn together, kind of patchwork style. And you are bringing the rice out of the canoe and you're spreading it over the top that birch bark tar, and you're letting it dry in the sun. This is also when you take really hyperactive little kids and you have them pick through and get out the bugs and other things that are supposed to be in there, and it's nice because it's been running through it and naturally kind of stirs it up so that it gets to dry in the sun. It keeps them busy, keeps them out of your hair. So we have dry and then we have parch. The next step is to get all of the moisture out. Anytime you are drying something, corn, oil, rice, anything else, moisture is your enemy. Right? For any of you who've done any preserving of food, you've got to get the moisture out, especially if you want to save it. So the parching step, you're taking the rice off of the mats and you're putting it inside a clay pot over a high heat fire and you're stirring it constantly with a wooden paddle. And the idea is get all the moisture out. You have to constantly stir it or it's going to burn. Okay. Once you have it parched, you have to dance the rice. Now here's the thing. Wild rice is it's more like, like a wheat or a cereal grain than it is what you would think of a, a traditional kind of rice or brown rice. And it has this shaft on the outside. Hopefully, if you've parched it properly, that husk or shaft on the outside is really dry and brittle. And when you go to dance it, it falls off. So what you would do back in the day is you would dig a pit about waist high. So it'd be about waist high. 
and you would line it with fresh buckskin. So you would sew buckskin together so to make a target. You would line the whole thing with buckskin. Then you put parched rice in the bottom, and you find again another energetic young person, and you put new moccasins on them, and you have them dance with rice. Like you're stopping grapes. Okay? But the idea is you're dancing on that rice, and you're separating the rice from the husk, from the shaft. Okay? And then the last step is winnowing. Okay? Winnow. It's like minnow, but with a W. You've got to get the dry bits you don't want separated from the wild rice. So you would again would use, um, it kind of looks like a larger platter, almost like a, a deeper serving platter, uh, a winnowing basket made out of a large bar. And you would fill it with danced rice, and you would stand with your back to the wind. And you would flick the rice up in the air. You kind of have to have that, that fancy chef, you know, you see them flipping stuff in pans, you kind of have to flip it up into the air because the wind is at your back, it's going to blow off the dry bits you don't want away, and you're going to be left with the rice in the bottom of your basket. Now, here's the thing. If you bring 50 pounds of rice to shore, by the time the process is over, you may have 15 pounds of rice. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. But wild rice is one of the things that we're most known for as far as tribes um, in the Midwest. All other tribes in the country know us for the wild you know, where you know most of the tribes of the Southwest for uh, the, the player of Dolby Homes and Turquoise, we're wild rice. Okay. Now, you're also collecting things that you're going to need uh, for ceremonial items. Um, you're collecting metal stems for twine, gold rod stems for pipes, cattail flowers for torches. They're amazing for torches. Um, angelica stems for whistles, uh, cattail leaves and wool brushes for making baskets or mats. Um, you're getting white cedar leaves and sage leaves for smudging. Um, you're also harvesting some commercial items too. Uh, there was actually quite a bit of trade between tribes uh, in terms of trading balsam fir, um, pine, uh, princess pine, and wild rice. That was something that was commonly traded throughout. Uh, the reason why they're treating uh, the princess pine and also bird is that's what you're going to use as insulation in your home for the winter. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Winter. It feels like we're still in winter. But technically, <laughs> it's December, January, and February. Um, December is a little spirit moon. January is great spirit moon, and February is sucker moon. S U C K E R. And there are different stories as to why. Some of them are, are in reference to bottom feeders, like catfish and whatnot, being prevalent at, at that time of February. Um, but other translations also refer to that sucking and popping sound on the waves when the ice starts to break. You're on the lake and you hear that, you know, that's usually February when that starts happening. So you come together in a huge group for sugar bush. You come together in a huge group for harvesting your wild rice. In the winter, you split up. Okay? You can't have your whole tribe in one area during the winter because you're going to overtax your resources. You're going to overtax the available firewood. You're going to overtax the available animals. So what we see is the tribes breaking up in what they call bands, B-A-N-D-S, bands. This is important. If you're aware of the tribes in the state, we have six Ojibwe bands. Black to Flambeau, Red Cliff, Le Cure, Lake, St. Croix. They're bands. Okay. Why are they termed as bands? Well, a lot of the times what happened was is when they had major contact with what eventually becomes the United States, it was during the winter. And you're broken into your smaller groups. Now what a band is, is it's kind of a mini version of your tribe. So make it easy. Your tribe has four clans. Okay? You've got four clans. 
And each one of those plants has teachers in it, warriors in it, and hunters in it, and healers in it. Okay? But you don't want all your plants in one place together. So what you do is you mix them all up. You have one band with an even number of members of each clan, and you have another band and another band. And you spread out and split up. This is done for two reasons. It increases your chance of survival in the winter. But if there's warfare, and say two of those bands are wiped out, you still have two bands left, and they still represent pieces of the entire tribe, so that you have the ability to be from. You're not losing everything all on one bus. So while resting ends, you've got all of your supplies, you trudge out to your winter camps. Now, you're taking advantage of the freezing weather. You're not typically, unless you're having a feast, you're not typically taking down um, a lot of deer or elk or bears during the spring, summer, and fall because how do you keep that meat? They're not refrigerators. So unless you're consuming it completely right away, or you're taking the time to dry it for future use, in the winter, you have a little more grace. You can store some of those larger pieces of meat. So the men are out hunting. What are the kids doing? Well, you're trying to get them outside as much as you can to work out energy. But what we did in the winter months was tell stories. That was how the kids learned um, the tribal histories. Throughout the year, they're learning all the basics that they need um, insofar as like the skills to survive and whatnot. But when it comes to actually teaching them, uh, the tribal histories, uh, lessons about tribal ceremonies, it's only done in the winter time. The reason for that is that it's believed that some animals that hibernate during the winter are more spiritually bad than they are good. So if those beings are hibernating, they can't hear your stories, which keeps you safe. So there's a lot of storytelling going on. There's also ice fishing. So right here, <clears throat> this is from the Milwaukee Public Museum collection. This is actually from the Talicho or the dog remnant from Yellow Canada. This is an ice fishing pole. So you have your pole here. You have sinew or twine as your name. <clears throat> and then you have your hook. And that's a fish rib. Oftentimes you were using those as your fishing hooks, so that's what you would take in your ice fishing pool. Snowshoes, that was something you could also be working on during the winter time. Two different kinds of snowshoes. <clears throat> we have the pointed snowshoes and we have what they call the bear paw. These are the ones you want to use when the snow is super falling. That's going to get you through the snow better. These pointed ones are what you're going to want to use when the snow is really you're also probably going to be pretty bored during the winter. And one of the neat things that, um, I don't know if you're aware of the Indian Community School down in Franklin, but they're trying to bring back a lot of the traditional games. And one of the traditional games uh, was the snow snake game. And you can play this all the different types of rules and different types of ways to play it. But right here is the snow snake. And essentially, what you would do is you would have the kids, you know, walk in a line, heel toe, heel toe, and try to make uh, a narrow path for as long as you can. And the idea would be to, one of the basic games, is to see who can throw that snow snake down that trail the farthest. Who can go the farthest, or maybe they would put some kind of markers that say, okay, well, you have to throw it, but it has to land within here. You also have dice games. They can be made with various different shells and whatnot. And then here we have the pin and cup game. This is one of those games where like you have the cup and then the ball on the string. <laughs> so there's things to keep yourself occupied. You're also still harvesting. Uh, jack pine, black spruce, um, you're using that for basing uh, your uh, snowshoes. Uh, moss is being uh, harvested for insulation and diaper cleaning. That. 
white birch fungus for air pressure and fire starters. Um, white cedar leaves and wild grapevines are used as shampoos and air conditioners. Um, and you're harvesting lots of different types of wood, uh, like oak, red pine, maple, sugar maple. Um, and you're using those things to make sleds, cradle boards, skis, snowshoe frames, basket frames, lodge poles, push poles, flutes, whistles, fish decoys, bows, lacrosse sticks. Winter is when you're getting all of your stuff done in anticipation for spring. As the end of February starts going around and things start warming up, we can start all over again. Where are we going to go for sugar? Are we going to go to the same camp or are we going to do a different camp? And the cycle starts over and over again. The last thing we're going to talk about is the seven fires prophecy. So you'll, you'll hear a lot nowadays um, from tribes about seven generations. And a lot of times when you're making decisions, uh, you make your decisions with the next seven generations in mind. What we decide now, how is that going to affect them? Seven generations of them. Because many of the native belief systems are very focused on the here and now and not after. So what you do while you're alive is to benefit those who will be here after you. I don't do what I do so that it benefits me after I die. It's how is my way of carrying myself in the world going to affect the next seven generations. So you'll see the number seven a lot. So the seven fires prophecy is something that's been around for quite some time. Um, it was that seven prophets showed up and left the people with seven predictions of what the future would bring. And each prophecy was called a fire. And each fire would refer to a particular time with events, very specific events. When this happens, you know you're in this fire. How do you tell the time? Now, the first three fires spoke of migration, of moving, of finding the place where you're going to live. For the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe groups in North Wisconsin, their story was looking for the place where people grew on water. They're not originally from here, originally from the Northeast. The fourth fire <clears throat> was actually told to them by two prophets acting as one. And there's two parts for it, an either or essentially. One of the prophets said, You're going to know, you will know the future of our people by the face of the light skinned grace wearers. If they come wearing the face of brotherhood, then there will come a time of wonderful change for generations to come. They will bring new knowledge and articles that can be joined with the knowledge of this country. Or, beware if the light skin race comes wearing the face of death. You must be careful because the face of brotherhood and the face of death look very much alike. If they come carrying a weapon, beware. If they come in suffering, they could fool you. You shall know that the face they wear is one of death if the rivers run with poison and fish become unfit to eat. You shall know that the body is many things. The fifth prophet said, <clears throat> In the time of the fifth fire, there will come a time of great struggle that will rip the lives of all native people. At the waning of this fire, there will come among the people one who holds the great promise of great joy and salvation. If the people accept this promise of a new way and abandon the old teachings, then the struggle of the fifth fire will be and will be with the people for many generations. The sixth fire. In the time of the sixth fire, it will be evident that the promise of the first fire came in a false way. Those deceived by this promise will take their children away from their teachings of the elders, and at this time, the new sickness will come to them. Now, when these predictions are being made, a lot of the people were just like, okay, yeah, things are great now. We have all of our medicines. We don't have to worry about sickness or any of these things. But eventually, these things did start happening. Um, when we talk about um, specifically the fifth fire, you know, we've got a lot of wars happening on the East Coast, right? With the arrival of the Europeans, a lot of fighting over land, a lot of death and destruction, a lot of small pox. 
blood, disease, and sickness. When the sixth fire came, uh, many believe that that was when the children were being taken to boarding schools because you're taking them away from the teaching of their elders and then new sickness forms. And unfortunately, because of the boarding schools, a lot of our people turn to drugs and alcohol to escape to know. And this would be that that's, um, that's the sixth fire. The seventh fire, though, which is believed that that's what we're in right now. So when you, when you listen to the stories and the teachings of the elders, they believe that this young generation now is the seventh generation at the time of the seventh fire. And so the seventh prophet, which this is yet to come to pass, said, at the time of the seventh fire, new people will emerge. They will retrace their steps to find what was left by the trail. Their steps will take them to the elders, who they will ask to guide them on their journey. But many of the elders will have fallen asleep. They will awaken to this new time with nothing to offer. And some of the elders will be silent because no one will ask anything of them. The new people will have to be careful in how they approach the elders. The task of the new people will not be easy. If they remain strong in their quest, the sacred fire will again be lit. It is at this time that the light-skinned race will be given a choice between two roads. If they choose the right road, then the seventh fire will light the eighth and final fire, an eternal fire of peace and love for the brother and sister. If they make the wrong choice of the roads, then the destruction which they brought with them in, the coming, in coming to this country will come back at them and cause much suffering and death to all of those people. So when they talk about going back to the trail, a lot of that has to do with really beginning in the 1960s and 70s during what was called the Red Power Movement. I don't know if any of you remember the occupation of Alcatraz. Uh, that was considered to be the beginning of the Red Power Movement. Uh, we also have in our area the occupation of the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Station in Virginia. It's no longer in the lake or anymore. That was um, we also have the occupation of the Alexa Brothers Officiate in China, um, just outside the Menominee Reservation. And that set of fire is supposed to be the Native people kind of saying, okay, we're, we're getting back to our teachings, we're getting back to our ways, and we want to relearn these things. Um, and that many of the elders will have fallen asleep. The elders are the ones who were taken to boarding school when they may be nothing. But that they're part of this as well. And when we talk about climate change and the issues that we're having, it's believed that that's, that's that decision. Two choices. What are you going to do? Are you going to go back and do things the old way and help them restore where you live, your little piece of the garden? Or are you going to choose the wrong way and destroy things? So it's interesting how all of these things fit together. And I think it's it's kind of you know nice to end on that note before we have the other um, parts of the lecture series because it, it is one of those times where we kind of have to decide what's important. And hopefully <laughs> we make the right choice and things get better. If not, I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. But it's the seventh generation, it's the seventh fire, and hopefully. Um, that eighth fire is lit, and it's just a time of peace and love and brotherhood and sisterhood. But it's up to us to work to get to that point. Thank you. Now we have time for questions. How do you keep from this part and draw it down to the cutting board? Uh, what you would do is you would uh, melt down fat um, into uh, tallow, and much like you're using it to uh, the, pro uh, the process of tanning hides and whatnot, you would use that as kind of a uh, moisture period. Good question. When the beds went for their winter separation, mm -hmm. did they have a particular area that was assigned to each band? 
So every winter they go back to their area. They wouldn't necessarily go back to the same area every winter, but they would have they would have a very distinct area. So when they separate, it's you're going this way, you're going this way, you're going this way, you're going this way. Now there was change if say perhaps the last winter they noticed they were having to go further and further and further out for hunting meat. Then you might say, okay, let's let's pick a different spot next year instead of going there. We're going to go over here. So there is there is an idea of land ownership kind of in that sense, but it's of, of use and uh, managing resources more so. But no, they were very they were very planned out as to where they were going to be going because if something happened, you know, if war broke out or whatever, and you needed to get everybody back together. You need to know where to send your runners out to bring them back. Mm -hmm. I thanks for this wonderful talk. It's really great. Um, I'm wondering if you know a very effigy that was located near the Cedar Park Playhouse for the last ten years. Is it known if there is any archaeological treasures? It's, it's unfortunate. It's estimated that over three quarters of the mounds that existed have been destroyed so far. Um, but we have a blizzard going far, not too far from here. Um, and there are LIDAR images of much of the area. And I have looked at LIDAR for that particular piece. What LIDAR is, is it's the special way of the natural that removes all structures. And it removes all trees, all plants, and it literally looks at just the tree, what exists on the tree. So it's a way for you to look at this particular picture particular of these areas and see, okay, that outline looks like a mirror or a bowl, or that's a tumble or a hand or whatnot. Um, one of the things that I'm going to start working on is having a conversation with the land trust that's working to protect that area because it's monopoly land. And it's actually contested as to whether or not they can actually get out of this culture. This is politics. But uh, really looking to make sure it's protected because I know that's a fight that's going on right now with all of us. So trying to protect it and preserve the changes. We're working on it. Yes. Uh, what would be the attitude for respecting all plans? When after um, white settlers came, there were a lot of invasive plants, and nowadays we think about garlic mustard. Oh, yes. So, actually, what forms? I don't know if any of you remember the walleye forms in northern Wisconsin. Yeah, I can see some of you remember that. Um, so, we ended up with the Golden Boy decisions that come out in the late 70s or 80s uh, that look at regulating uh, tribal rights on. Um, um, because of all of this information and whatnot that was happening in this at that time, a group called the Lizard Wilderness Forum, which is the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, we're essentially the state of the And so, what the Lizard Group does is it works in the tree areas in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan um, in order to protect the environment. Um, so, they actually work in partnership with the DNR in digging out invasive species, um, including the Asian carp, the zebra mussels, the blue stripe, the mustard grass. Um, and it's interesting because when I took our time, we asked the DNR to take a much more and it really actually stepped up and did a lot more. Um, if you look up Glyphwick, um, Dr. you can actually see all of the surveys they do on the land, and they set the native voluntary uh, limits and things like that for the Chinese and the Mississippi Territory in order to maintain. Uh, they also work with the fish hatcheries that many of the tribal in Wisconsin have. And I believe they stock over 30 million fish a year in Wisconsin and it's not that much. So that is definitely something the tribes are investing in is to protect the environment. Basic species are doing some damage. So the point is the Great Lakes Indian Fishing and Wildlife Commission.
So while I'm talking about this, I'm going to While I'm searching, is there another question? I'm a gardener, and I think I'm going to try that type of gardening just for the fact that it's good. The reason but I'm wondering why it's amazing. I'm wondering how they kept the critters from getting them. I see ladies. <laughs> That's where little kids and the elders come in. So uh, those are the two groups you pull your scarecrows from. <laughs> uh, you, would, you would have the younger kids. Um, ran around um, and make noise. And for the elders that weren't, um, weren't mobile enough in order to um, actually, you know, get around and help, you mm -hmm. would plop them down and let them on the screen and throw some at them. But by and large, you may have passed those early stages where you actually have the sprouts coming out. Um, once that squash settled, they got left alone because it's washed they got creatures on the lines and a lot of animals don't like that food that year. So for example, this is a map of the tree area for the Menominee. So this specifically the mic went up. I love that. <laughs> so this particular map looks at only the Menominee land that was given up. Okay, and it's done very piecemeal. So what we have in Wisconsin is shoot, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't go back to work. So the major tree that was written in Wisconsin in the land actually was the 1825 Treaty of Prairie Machine. So we signed up for a property Prairie Machine in 1825. And the government said it was a treaty of peace and friendship. One of the friends were not taking this not only as a one of the friends. But we need to know where you live. So it's time to go to your area. We know who to talk to about how to get them out. And we also need to know where you live so we can keep in touch with each other. So basically, what they did is they put a big map of the Western Great Lakes up and asked all the tribes to draw where you live. What they instantly had was a roadmap. Uh, if you were in this area, this is where we go. So if in 1827, we want the rest of the Green Bay when we know to go to the Oneida. Because that's where they were. In 1831, though, is where the Menominee was this land, literally. Okay, so everything north of the Milwaukee River is Menominee land. Technically, everything down the Chicago is Menominee land, but the Potawatomi are based in there. And that's just a whole bunch of us. But it's the 1831 treaty um, where the Menominee are approached and asked to share their land with the New York natives, the Oneida, the Stafford, the Louisiana, and the Wellington. Okay, so my tribe was moved here, and the Menominee are asked, can you share this with them? Well, what ended up happening instead was the Oneida were given this area here. And the soccer twins and the and brother Tim were given this area here, and all the rest was sold off to myself. So they were told they were going to be sharing the land with the New York natives, but in the end, that land was all sold off. So there, are, there is language in the treaty that says they retain the right to it as long as it was not sold by the President of the United States. And this land specifically was not sold by the President of the United States because they actually do have a ability to claim it should they choose to. So every treaty is messy, but usually what you have is here's here's 1848, here's 1836, here's 1832, here's 1816. It's very small piecemeal chunks. So when they decided they wanted the mass, the mass area, they go to the whole chunk and they would take that little piece. So it was a piece of you. It wasn't huge spots. Um, when you look at the bigger portions, that's more down in the south, um, in the Cherokee and the Choctaw, which you can tell me is similar to the they wanted more large portions of land in one fell swoop for meditation. You need to get them in the big rocks, not small rocks. Any questions on mine at all? Any other questions? 
So what about the, your language? Has, has, uh, has it survived? So my language in particular, I'm going to have a point to talk about, um, is in the good point to have a culinary dialect. Unfortunately for Oneida, I'm, I think for Oneida in Wisconsin, we have four elder stuff that are really mm -hmm. fluent. Are they teaching it? Some of them actually have been teaching. Um, WGB has done amazing work. They have been working with the elders. They actually have an Oneida English English to Oneida dictionary online that you can actually use audio as well. They have some of the elders saying words. You can say, okay, we're going to learn it. This is the English I'm going to see in Oneida here. Um, there are also a lot of advances with technology. Uh, Try to get into uh, working with a group called Ford Media, and they're creating apps to teach language. So kind of like Rosetta's own type of stuff. Um, several tribes uh, in the Yupik up in uh, Alaska and uh, North parts of Canada have actually worked with software developers to create like video games for the Nintendo and for PlayStation. Um, so that the kids learn stories, they could progress through stories, but they also have uh, language. The Indian community school definitely frightened with teaches uh, on our name and I have a chunk of editing for you as well. And we have that you know, in Hawaii, um, an Ojibwe linguist uh, teaching there. When I was there for under I actually took Ojibwe for three semesters. Is it very difficult to learn if you have not spoken to this? It can be. It can be. Um, it's one of those things where it's that if you don't lose it, you lose it. So for me, learning it, if I don't have someone else to speak it with, it's, it's difficult. But I do remember some things, like my, my favorite culture with her is the CDs and the AD Chicago. The Saturday. It's one of the floors coming day. It's just fun to say. Um, but it, it is difficult. You know, and, and I, I took, you know, Spanish and French, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school. And it's so easy to learn it then. Um, but they really, they really are many pushes because it's believed that of the more than a thousand or so languages we had here, there's probably less than 200 that are still viable. Can you repeat it? Can you repeat it? Was there permanent villages or settlements where people were occupied all the time and then we came back to it over and over again? Because it seems like so many activities took people away uh, from hunting and fishing or gardening or rice um, In our area, the morning, um, and then the opening of Soccer Creek before Washington. Um, anytime you have major intersections of water, it's oftentimes where you would find a permanent settlement. Of course, at least long term, you know, semi permanent settlement. Um, when you look at Highway 43, for example, and it's going to be interesting to see as they widen what they find, because 43 was a regular trade route that was widely, widely traveled along with going along with us on the short way. Uh, for us, Milwaukee, uh, Port Washington, uh, we have Stock Hill because of the Stock, the Scotty, were living there since they were there for them. They were there at the time of the European arrival, so Stock Hill comes from them. I'm sorry I keep opening my mouth. That is a curiosity. That's all right. I have always wondered how in the world, um, when you get a baby, that was tied to a, a boost, tied to a, a board. Uh -huh. I mean, a baby has to be changed five, six times a day. How did they manage? So that's called a ticket noggin or a cradle board. And it's kind of like how you see with babies, they like to be bound up, they like to be swaddled. Um, that's when you would use moss. Moss was your diaper weight. Um, and the moss, you would harvest a lot of it when you're done with the good shoes, it was really nice and dry. Uh, but basically, you would have moss all around the front, behind, and whatnot, and you would unlace them, you know, lace them down again. And then, mm -hmm. and then, if you look at the cradle boards, a lot of them would have uh, in front of these had their open uh, kind of this wooden band that would go. That was so if you had them resting against something and they tipped over, they wouldn't snag. 
All right, I think we're gonna close the Q&A session at this time. We are gonna be hanging out and milling around and talking with everybody. So please do stick around if you think of something else or you have any questions or comments. Um, again, I'm so happy all of you guys came in person. It's so nice to see all of you. Uh, we hope you join us for May 18th is when we'll be doing the next lecture. Um, I'll be running that one myself. Um, we'll be talking about European settlement and the change of mindset about the earth. Same time, same place. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you.